Welcome to Town Experience Live, your weekly look at all of the hot topics in HR. People are 28% more productive when they use vacation time, involving themselves very deeply in diversity and inclusion efforts. Ramping up college recruiting and career fairs. Artificial intelligence helps automate certain tasks. 50% more applications. How do you make your company culture still stand out? What does that look like in this new virtual world? Welcome, welcome, welcome everyone to another episode of Talent Experience Live. Uh, Of course, your weekly look at hot topics in HR, interviews with leaders, and of course, my favorite uh, new HR tech. Uh, This is covering everything that you need to know in talent acquisition, talent management, um, and everything really in between all things HR. Uh, So be sure to follow Phenom and the show on your favorite social channels, whether it be Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, and of course, professionals favorite, LinkedIn, uh, so that you'll never miss an episode and also uh, get short clips uh, around the the show itself. Of course, this is a live show, so please hop into the chat, be active, ask your questions, uh, share your comments, your stories. We love the interaction. I know that we are working on some gifts for people who are regularly participating in that, so definitely chime in. I'm Devin Foster, and as we all know, yesterday we celebrated Veterans Day, Um, so that is why today's topic is all around military hiring and the value of veterans. Um, We have a a bunch of guests today that I am super excited about talking around technology's role in military hiring um, and the value that veterans can bring to your business. So uh, we will be joined by Andrew Whitman, a Marine Corps infantry combat veteran and former federal agent of the U.S. Capitol Service, as well as Matt Disher, military recruiting program leader at Cushman and Wakefield and veteran of the U.S. Marines. And then we also have Sean O'Donnell, our product manager, uh, who will be chiming in at the end to show us a a bit of a product demonstration on how to aid in military hiring. So without any further hesitation, like I said, we have a packed show today. So let's bring on Andrew Whitman. Andrew, how are you? Good, Devin. Thanks for having me, man. Thank you for joining. It is a a pleasure to have you on the show. And before we get started, thank you for your service. Um, Really, it can't thank you enough. Appreciate it. Hope you got to enjoy yourself a little bit on on Veterans Day um, and enjoy some of the the festivities and lots of thanks there. Um, But as we, we jump into the interview, my favorite thing to do on the show is always to ask people about their background and how you became an expert into to talking around military hiring. Yeah. So my whole, I, you know, my company's called the mental toughness training center. So my whole shtick, I guess is mental toughness. Uh, and uh, I was the fat kid in high school and I got bullied a lot and uh, I just didn't want to live my life in fear and anxiety. So, Hey man, the Marine Corps had what I needed. So I enlisted <laughs> in the Marine Corps, you know, and, um, and I spent six years in the infantry and that gate that's that got me on the path of this obsession I have with mental toughness. How do I get the body, mind and emotions all to work together? Um, and that rolled into a law enforcement career. Uh, and I was with, uh, I guess my great claim to fame as the agent, uh, in, uh, the federal business was I was the agent in charge of Nancy Pelosi's detail. And I personally protected Hillary Clinton and some heads of state. And then I went over to the state department and I started uh, doing high threat diplomatic security. I did four tours in Afghanistan and then Jordan and Kosovo. And what we were doing, we were taking SEALs, Marines, Rangers, and SF guys that had hard you know, military skills, but putting them in diplomatic security environments. So we had to retrain how we think. Um, and so I, yeah, I did that at the State Department for like five years. And I thought, you know, I could, corporate needs this, you know, and I don't have to get shot at while I'm in the state. You know, so I was like, let's start a business. And that's, that's where we're at, man. That's that's awesome. I love the the thought of mental toughness. As all of my my fellow phenoms know, uh, working with me, I um, am kind of infamous now at 
phenom for running shirtless in the winter, whether it be snowing, whether it be rain, not the same type of mental toughness that you're used to at all. I look like a, a sissy Lala compared to that. No, but no, it's, it's, certainly, it's certainly something that I appreciate. And I think uh, it can be applied to so many aspects of the professional world, right? Is that ability to, to look a challenge in the eyes and, and really overcome it. And your expertise and, and your experience um, really showcases this type of resiliency. So as I, I think we as a, a global community are really having to show our resilience during the time of COVID and, and this pandemic, um, how have has that helped during this, this challenging year? Right. So that's and that's the, the whole stick about like hiring veterans. Right. So what happens is they they're in a crucible and you, you really can't. It, it's hard to duplicate this outside the military environment where you're living in this barracks and what the military does. Like I didn't figure it out when I was a, when I was young and I was in the military. We get all mad because they would change the plan 15 times in like 10 minutes. Right. And so it'd be like another change, another change. But what they're doing is, get, is building up your resilience. Right. So ca- how can you handle change? How change management? How can you handle the emotional response when we give you another curveball, right? And so, and 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 that is like one of the keys that you get when you hire a veteran is that you you really it's hard to duplicate that because you're with it 24 seven. When especially when you're deployed, you, you know you're with um, that mindset and this resilience. There's no way out. There's no vacation. You can't take a day off. Even when your duty shifts over, you're still on alert, right? So I think that's. It's a huge thing, especially like you said, with what's going on with COVID. Things were thrust on us without. I mean, we don't. It, a lot of times, you could do change gradually with culture or whatever. Man, this was just shoved on us, and you're either going to sink or swim. You know? No, no. I, it certainly was shoved on us, and I think whether we like it or not, we're we're stuck with it now. We're continuing to deal with it um, as the situation worsens in certain areas, and. Um, it, it, having that idea of, of always being on, I think is, is something super important um, when it comes to military hiring and not necessarily something that you regularly think of when you, you think of hiring veterans, right? Uh, oftentimes you think of, you know, people who will get the job done at all costs, but those soft skills that you pick up along the way, I think are, are super important. And how do those soft skills help when it comes to your organization and, and when you're hiring and how will they help in the future um, as you know, we continue to work through not only this pandemic, but the overall job market changes. Right. So, and here's a, here's a couple of great things that we don't think of when we talk about soft skills, but uh, dealing with difficult people, right. Dealing with difficult personalities, like in, in the, you know, the veteran world, right. We've had to deal with crazy bosses that are in our face since boot camp. So we're desensitized. We don't take it personal when you're, you know, like a boss is difficult or they yell at us or snap or someone's having a bad day. Like we don't internalize that. So dealing with difficult people is a soft skill that's already trained into it. Um, you, obviously the can do attitude you said, but here's one that we don't really think about uh, that is so huge is diversity and inclusion. Because we're in the crucible. It doesn't matter what uh, – I mean, it's every imaginable background, race, socioeconomic, personality, education, religion. And, and I'll tell you what, nothing like a little incoming fire, right, to knock, you know, knock the differences out of you. You know what I mean? Like you don't care about that anymore, right? So yeah. we've we gotten over all that stuff, and you're already bringing that soft skill in where, you know, we, we can get along with everybody. Even if our personality – we don't like each other. I used to have this thing, right, be like, don't you trust me with your life? Yes, but I don't trust you in cards or with my sister, but I trust you with my life, right? So you can get a lot, you have to figure a way to get the mission accomplished. And I think that's a soft skill that really gets undersold in the hiring process. No, it's, it's, it's certainly something when organizations are looking at, at changing their company culture, right? Um, and they're looking to add diversity and inclusion. It's also important to, to bring individuals around that are comfortable with that, right? That are comfortable with different cultures and different types right. of people. Um, and I think that's something that isn't thought of. Um, when you're you're hiring for diversity and inclusion is not only do you need, you know, people that are different, but also people that are comfortable around individuals who, who are different. So um, that certainly helps. Now, the other question that I, I had is uh, a personal struggle that, that I've really dealt with during this time working from home. I'm a very people person, right? That's why I'm right. on the show. I love talking to people, especially face to face. And now I can't tell you how many Slack messages, how many emails, how many different transactions where things are just lost in translation via text. If somebody doesn't put the right punctuation on something, I think that they're mad at me, right? Or I I think that I did something wrong. 
How can that mental toughness that you talked about earlier be applied in this modern world of, you know, constant communication, which may not always be face to face. Right. And that's the first thing. So I always like to remember that if I read a text or a Slack message or an email and there's a tone, I know I'm the one bringing the tone. Right. So it's, I, 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 so, and this is one of our mantras that we teach is that I'm the problem and I'm the solution. If I have a problem, it's me. Um, but the good news is that I bring the solution. So, and I always remember, listen, when I'm texting somebody, it, it could come across different too, depending on where they're at. When do they get it? Or, you know, what exactly what's going on in their day? Do that, where's that tone? So if I get an email that I think has a tone, I stop and I'll be like, wait a minute, man. If I, if I ever done this, if I ever written something that could be taken the wrong way, I think I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt. Right. So that's where that kind of mental toughness comes over self-aware. Like, yeah, you know what? I've cut people off of traffic before. Let's not <laughs> put this guy off just because, you know, he cut me off. I've done it. You know, I'm not being mean. He's probably not being mean. You see what I'm saying? Like that, no, that, that kind of mindset helps. Yeah. One, yeah. 100 percent. I, I to, to give you a little background, I grew up in the, the northeast, the tri-state area, and I went to college in Florida. So I brought that um, very northeast yeah. aggression with me when I drove. And if <laughs> I would have talked to you beforehand, I probably would have saved myself some verbal altercations with myself in the car. I'm not even talking to anyone else. No, right, I know. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I love that aspect of, of looking internally for that solution and, and really solving you know, problems that you're creating. Um, but I think the, the, the biggest aspect of, of when we talk about military hiring um, is obviously it's it's a different background than the traditional route, right? Um, right. I, I personally went to school with a, a four years college degree. I know that uh, a lot of military professionals do as well. However, there are some that don't. That that experience that they gained through the armed services um, was their education, right? And it doesn't mean that they didn't learn things or they, they didn't sit through the boring lectures that I had to sit through um, in order to learn that. They got real world experience. So when organizations are looking to hire um, you know, veterans as a whole, how can they look at the differences between a traditional route and, and one that went through you know, our, our, our service men and women? Um, and how can they apply those to their organization? Right. And, you know, uh, I think we talked about this before, right? It's almost like you're if you're getting talent acquisition, you almost have to have somebody that's like the, the bridge, like a dating app. Right. So somebody that can translate corporate for military and then match those skills up. Right. So um, I don't know if there's technology that does that yet, but I mean, that would be a great thing in order. To, you, know, you could plug in what your military stuff and then we could see what it looks like, you know, corporate instead of just saying, well, you know, you don't have a four year degree. Um, we can't, you know, I, that's the minimum cutoff because there's a lot of stuff that they bring in the crucible, right? That, you know, the, the uh, unit cohesion, mission accomplishment, troop welfare, looking out for each other, plus getting the thing done. There's no excuses culture, right? A lot of those things, we want that. And we can probably uh, train the hard skills, if you will. It's hard to train these these soft skills that we're talking about, which I, they're not really soft. They're actually difficult skills it, without putting them in a crucible, right? So, for me, when I'm hiring, I want to look at these things first. I can train the hard skills, right? I can trade you how to write code, you know, if I need a computer program. But I can't train you necessarily to get along with everybody and to have that. I can, you know, let's get it done. It doesn't matter. Come hell or high water, we're taking the hill kind of thing. You see what I'm saying? So no, I think, no, one, yeah, 100. percent I always, I was going to say, we can teach you Microsoft Office, we can teach right. you Excel, but when it comes down to this, this boss is a little bit challenging to work with. Sometimes they'll be extra critical. We can't teach you not to fly off the handle for that. That's, right. that's something that, um, you know, you, you have to, to bring to the table. Um, and we, we talked a bit about bias um, for, for a moment there. And um, I, before I jump into that, I, I did want to say Phenom does offer a military search code um, where oh, veterans awesome. can, can log into a, a career site, type in their military code and see what applies to that. And I have some, some previous recruiter experience of, of working at a logistics company um, where I had a tremendous amount of, of veterans look to, to be hired. Um, but the logistics that they were used to was, was different than logistics that, that I was hiring for, right? I was right, a right. third party um, logistics service. They weren't moving around and, and setting up times for military weapons, for Humvees or anything like that. So when they came to the interview, they, they weren't expecting that. And, and some of this technology would certainly help. But um, to jump back into to that recruiter bias idea, when we're looking at you know, those, those candidates that have those, those soft skills, um, yeah, I think 
recruiters almost need to retrain themselves, right? Um, right? And technology, of course, will always help. But when it comes to, you know, searching for individuals, if you were to, to give them a piece of advice on what to look for on a military professional's background um, in order to hire them for, you know, certain positions, what would be some of those misconceptions they may have previously had that, that you could uh, point out? Oh, wow. That's a great question. And, and a lot of it, without knowing the military, so I get, I have guys that help, you know, I help them all the time. They're young dudes. I'm always mentoring like even junior military officers, or even young guys coming out and I'll look in the right, the resume and it's all in military ease. Right. So it'll be like, listen, man, you are a helicopter pilot. Like you need to put down that you're a high pressure, you know, not, don't tell me like you were flipping this switch and that switch. Like who doesn't want to, I, I want a Cobra pilot on my team. You need to lead with that. Not like, Oh, I was also, I wrote this policy and that policy. So I'm going to look for, high pressure stuff, like things that you would go, that's cool. That they're probably like, like a helicopter pilot, an infantry grunt, a machine gunner, a sniper, you know, some, somebody that, that was in, uh, you know, the Rangers or psyops, or even if they were like, um, public affairs, right? Because you know, if they're, if they're a public affairs officer, they're getting shouted at by the press and they have to craft a message that doesn't like give away classified information and they got to keep the trash together right in front on the podium. Mm -hmm. Like those are the things I'm going to look for. Cause that's somebody who has been in the crucible that I know I could use that because they're probably a critical thinker and they're not what I call an emotional reactor. They have to be a reasonable responder. Right. So, or a first responder. Like think about this. If a firefighter showed up to like a fire and they're like, Oh my gosh, the house is on fire. What would we think? <laughs> right. We're like, Oh my gosh, the training isn't working. Right. So I'm, yeah. I think I'm getting a first responder, somebody that's been under pressure they're not going to freak out when it hits the fan. Like that's my number one thing I'm looking for because in this world, like you found out with COVID, man, it could hit the fan at any time. Yeah. No, that's a, it's a great way to look at it. It's almost like it, for military professionals, they, they need to speak both languages, right? Their language right. that they're used to and also the language that, that recruiters are, are used to seeing around those high pressure situations because they're not familiar with what some of those positions may entail and, and what comes along with them. Um, and I, I think that that's, that's so important. I mean, if you were to extrapolate this into a different situation where um, you're an individual who, you know, is, is looking for a job overseas in, in, in French, right? You can't read their application unless you speak that language. Correct. The same thing goes for military hiring. If you don't understand the language of what being a helicopter pilot means, it doesn't mean you're taking people around for tours around New York City. <laughs> it, means, right. it means that you are in, in the thick of it, right? You are not just flying that machine or you're in, in charge of lives, right? So right. Um, that's, that's super awesome. And I, I love, uh, hopefully some recruiters will, will gather some things from that. Now, tech can always be a, an adversary for recruiters and for um, and for applicants, right? Now, if there was one piece of technology that you could create today that would make it easier for military-based experiences to connect to soft skills on jobs, um, what would it be and, and, and how can career sites essentially paint that message? Yeah, I, for me, it would be kind of like, what is it like the, you know, my Apple, my phone updated and I got the Translate app on it, right? Or the Google <laughs> Translate. I would love, like, seriously love to sit down and, and I don't even know how you would build this, but you would have to get folks that are kind of like me, like Bridge, that like would work at corporate and you worked in the military. I mean, I sit down with guys and they're talking about in an interview, you know, we're prepping them for an interview. They're like, yeah, my battle rhythms were off. I'm like, whoa, don't go in there and say that <laughs> means your circadian rhythm was off, right? You were so okay. dragging this morning, right? See, what did you think when I said it? It's like, this guy's PTSD. I don't want him anywhere <laughs> near my company. Right? No, what he's saying is he needed an extra cup of coffee in the morning because he's dragging. He stayed up too late. See, it's just like that kind of jargon, right? It's like we need a way to like translate because it is literally two different languages. It is like speaking French and English. It's 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 so fascinating, right? And, and, and the way that I jumped when you said that that battle rhythm yeah. is the exact scenario that you're talking about. I'm like I, I I don't know what that means, but it, it sounds it sounds important. really bad, man. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It sounds like I don't um, want anything to do with that. Yeah. <laughs> no, it, that's that's awesome. And I, I guess my next question is is when you know individuals uh, maybe you you might have just answered it, but when recruiters are looking through their CRM through their their talent pools and they see something that may jump out, um, I'm going to ask you, it's worth the phone call, right? Um, yeah, for them absolutely. to explain those things. Um, yeah. And 
if you were in a recruiter's shoes, I think what questions would you pose to uh, people with military experience to try and maybe extrapolate some of those soft skills and some of those things that individuals who aren't used to putting them on resumes? Um, right. How would you go about asking those questions without being insulting, of course? Yeah, no, I always ask them, uh, I, I'll say it like this. I'll just do it like, like what kind of role playing. I'll be like, hey, um, listen, you don't have to answer this. I'm just, I'm just curious, right? What was your yeah. thought process in? Tell me your process of what you did when you, you know, when you were in Iraq or tell me the process. Cause if I'm looking for like some on the resume, like when you said that you were doing, you know, your guy was logistics or whatever, and you were bringing bulk fuel Humvees, what was your, you know, the thought process, what was the process that you guys go through and try to get them to just start talking about it? Well, I always ask them process questions because I want to see if they're critical thinkers, right? If they're like, well, you know, and they're just winging it, I probably don't want that. I'm not going to hire that. I'm not going to hire that person. I want somebody that has an actual thought process and a framework because then I can plug in those hard skills. If I know I don't want to teach somebody how to think when I'm hiring somebody. Does that make sense? If I no. can get somebody that thinks properly, I can plug in whatever inputs that I want. But if the program of thinking is all like helter skelter, yeah, pass. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I completely get that. That idea of, um, you know, I want to see how you work through these these problems and situations. And, and maybe a way to do that is. Um, rather than your typical, uh, my least favorite interview question is, is what are your strengths and weaknesses? Yeah, I don't even want to hear about that. That's a, that's a terrible question because people study it, right? They they practice their answer and it, it is what it is. That's a whole right. other story. It's, not, it's like on a date. You're gonna, you already know what you're going to say on the first date. <laughs> Trick anybody for a couple of weeks. I mean, come yeah. on, man. Uh, yeah. Exactly. But I, I think a, a way to, to get that out may be to ask a situation for a position that you're hiring that is difficult, right? So if mm -hmm. it is a sales position and it comes down to, hey, we just got outbid, you know, in the 11th hour, how would you yeah. handle this situation? What, what, what processes right. would you go through? Obviously, they're not working for the organization. They don't know the exact ones. But getting that thought process and understanding right. how they problem solve, I think, is, is great. You, you'll end up with a team of, of great hires. Right. Um, and then the other thing that I checked is we're, I want to make sure that they're not bringing drama in. OK, it ain't yeah. high school here. Like, I want to know, can you get along with people? There's two things. Are you problem oriented or solution oriented? And are you someone who can get along? Or are you someone who stirs the pot and spices the gumbo? Right. Yeah. Right. I don't want that. So those yeah. are the two things I'm looking for. Like a recruit, I should ask that from these from these veterans. That's, it, it, I, I, that's a great analogy. The stirring the gumbo. I'm a big gumbo guy. I love spicy yeah. food, but you don't necessarily need that aspect. In, right. in I don't want to say yeah. Yeah. Uh, So my, my last question for you before we let you go, cause I know you're, you're super busy is the idea around artificial intelligence, right? It's something yeah. that comes up, I think in every conversation, it's a buzzword. Right. Uh, people will throw it out just to sound fancy and sophisticated. <laughs> um, but when it comes to AI um, being leveraged in the military, um, how can those skills be applied to maybe an interview process where somebody's interviewing? And they say, hey, I used AI here um, and back it up with knowledge so that they're not just throwing it out as, like I said, a buzzword. Yeah. And again, I'm going to ask them the process because AI is so, I mean, and I, my, I'm super limited in it, but uh, it, there's a, it, it covers a whole lot of stuff. Like you said, a buzzword. So I'm going to ask them a clarifying question. Well, tell me about that. What was the process? What was the problem that AI solved and how did it go about solving it? Right. So if you're going to tell me, I'm going to make you walk me through what it is that it did and how did it do it? Right. And if you can't answer those two things, yeah, I mean, that's, you know, I drive a car. I don't, that doesn't mean I work on it. You're not going to hire me as a mechanic because I drive a car. <laughs> you could ask me how, to, you know, what, I don't know what spark plugs are, man. I don't know. <laughs> you can find that out but when you ask these process and then how, right? I want to say, well, what was the process and then how did it work? And then just kind of listen. And I always listen for their self-talk because you could tell if they really know what they're talking about or, you know, it's like when my kids were, my one kid was six, he could sound like he was an adult. He, you'd swear the guy knew what he was talking He's just mimicking what he heard, right? Yeah. Until you get him, to, until you get the how question in and then he can't tell how stuff works. No, I, I think that that's great is, is how it's solving the problem. They don't have to jump into the algorithms and all right. the intricacies around that. It's just, hey, this was the process and what we were doing. This is how it assisted us and this is how we got there and understanding that, that problem solving. Um, Andrew, this has been fantastic. You're a, a ball of energy. I had a, a blast <laughs> on this. Um, My battle rhythm is good. 
<laughs> before before I let you go, um, anything that you'd like to promote anywhere you'd like to send anyone, I'll, I'll give you your, uh, your your moment in the sun, if you will. Oh, yeah. Anybody can find me. And there's no fence around me. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on the Facebooks, the Twitters, and the Googles. But uh, my, my website is getwarriortough.com, um, getwarriortough.com. And um, I always answer my emails and my, my texts and all that. It might not take me 24 hours. It might take 48, but I will get back to you, I promise. But, and, and I apologize about the dog. He's upset about the 48 hours. He expects 24. I know, right? I'm <laughs> so back, man. Uh, but thank you so much for coming on. Um, we'll, we'll work through our battle rhythms on this, and hopefully we'll have you on again, maybe in person once things yeah. calm down with COVID. But uh, thanks again, and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Devin. Awesome. Well, there you have it. That was Andrew Whitman talking all around military hiring. Next up, we have Matt Disher, a military recruiting program leader at Cushman and Wakefield and also a U.S. veteran of the Marines. Uh, we'll bring him on now. Hey, Matt, how are you? Devin, doing well. Thanks. How are you? Oh, yeah. I am doing fantastic. You sound great as well. The microphone that you have, it looks space age and it just sounds like you're in the room with me. This is, this is spectacular. I, I, was, love I was going for that. I'm going for it. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Um, so Matt, as, as you heard, the first question I always love to ask everyone is to tell me a little bit about yourself and your role at Cushman and Wakefield and how you got into human resources. Uh, because every kid, as we know, grows up not wanting to be an astronaut, not wanting to be a policeman, but wanting to work in human resources. So how did that happen for you? Jeez, you know, so you're telling me that every little kid doesn't aspire to be in human resources and recruiting. I, I, I disagree. <laughs> Um, it, you know, I, I, uh, I served in the Marine Corps, as you mentioned before, I, uh, I have a family legacy of, of military service. So I went into it and I, I still joke around today, uh, yeah. that I don't know what I want to do when I grow up. I, um, I ended up in this, in this career field almost by accident where I went to work for a company that exposed me to a lot of, uh, how companies hire and, and, um, and strategies around hiring. And then one day I was approached to, start talking military to candidates to, to better build the military pipeline. And uh, that's really how I got into it. And now it's, I mean, over 10 years in my career so far. So fell into it by accident, just got good at it. I love it. I love every day of it and I enjoy it and I'll continue to do it. It's a, a beautiful thing when you fall into a profession that you're good at, right? That, that right. You just it, pick it up easily. And also before I, I go any further, thank you for your service. Um, I hope you enjoyed Veterans Day as well. Um, obviously, you are at Cushman and Wakefield, right? When Cushman and, and people think of that name, they don't necessarily think of, of military hiring, right? They think of commercial real estate. So mm -hmm. why is hiring veterans so important to your organization? And what are some steps that you're doing in order to address it? Yeah, so I'll start with this: that uh, we are not a household name. We're not a uh, we're not a consumer brand. So uh, the people that utilize us in in business are property owners and and things along those lines. People who who are dealing in commercial and industrial properties. And um, you know, if you look at a commercial property, I'm going to quote one of my one of my coworkers. His name is Vince Sumter. He is a uh, He's a recruiting legend is, is what I like to think of him as. He, t he, he says that you take a military ship and you turn it up on its end and it has all the same systems that a, uh, that a, a commercial property has in it. It has plumbing, it has electrical, it has all the different things that we have operating there. So, uh, you know, when you look at the people from the military, they have the same skills that everybody else in the civilian world does. And, you know, icing on the cake is that these are some of the uh, most educated uh, experienced, driven uh, people in, in the world. As far as the work workforce goes in the United States of America, these people have a higher level of high school diplomas, college educations, advanced degrees than do their similarly aged civilian counterparts. So you get a diverse, cultured group of people who operate in zero fail environments and you can plug them into your organization. Uh, it's a win-win for everybody. They are just frequently overlooked or, or maybe underutilized in corporate America. So we, um, we stand to gain not only you know, an advantage for our business in terms of how we develop business, but also the talent in the doors is some of the best in America. It's it, it, an amazing point uh, that you bring up there. I love that analogy around flipping the, the ship upside down, right? And uh, you're absolutely right. When I was entering the workforce versus someone who, who served in the military service, 
I didn't have any of those experiences, right? I, I went through my tests, studied for my exams, but I didn't get that, that real world experience where I had to problem solve, like what Andrew was talking earlier. Um, now, when Cushman looked at Phenom, um, I, I know that one thing was talked about was the military search bar. Um, how has this aspect of your career site helped veterans and military professionals find roles and how has it impacted your efforts? Have you seen the number increase um, and hires increase as well? I'll tell you this, that it, it is one of many of the, the different tactical items that we plug into the greater strategy and we are seeing the numbers go up. We see the applicant numbers go up. We see the the success and hire rate go up and, and things like that among our, our veteran population. It's hard to draw a parallel exactly to one function or the other, but it is among those functions, the, 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 the gears and the moving pieces uh, operating together. Um, that, that search function is a great tool you know, historically, and I'll, I'll talk about this for a second. Historically, there are these military skills translators that um, that don't necessarily always give the best results. And the idea here is that it's not necessarily translating the skills for the, the, the greater workforce. It's more like saying, hey, enter your MOC, your, your military occupational code, your MOS, your AFSC, or your rate. Uh, enter that number or that that uh, that different title into the search bar, and it'll tell you what jobs in our company have been matched. So it, it I've had some people come back and say, hey, there's nothing in here for me. Well, that's simply because the job in the military did not match a job that we have open inside of the company. Uh, but it leaves it open for another conversation that is, uh, what did you do in the military and how do we perfect the tool and how do we perfect our our uh, our availability and, and how we move a person forward into that process? So um, it's interesting. This year has not exactly been the year for benchmarking strategies uh, in what works and what doesn't. But uh, I will tell you this, that with all of these tools combined, we're doing very well, even given the circumstances of the year. And I look forward to uh, being able to plug these things in as we go into, let's, let's assume that 2021 or 2022 are more normal than 2020 has been. Uh, this has given us a great opportunity to, to sort of pilot and, and strategize a little bit better. So the future years will be amazing, in my opinion. That's, that's awesome. And, and the one thing that I, I love that you pointed out was this isn't a, a silver bullet, right? This one piece of technology isn't going to solve all of your problems. You're going to have to continue to work at it and you're going to have to continue to have those conversations if job matches don't necessarily come up. Um, but you kind of teased it a little bit earlier. It sounds like before you had this technology, you may yourself have been matched to some jobs that weren't necessarily up your alley. So before you found this this role that you are great at at, at Cushman and Wakefield, what type of jobs were you getting matched to um, as you re-entered the job market? I am a prime example of the person who leaves the armed forces and does not do a job that I did in the military uh, out here in the civilian world. So I was a combat engineer in the Marines. Uh, I went into this to learn construction trades because combat engineers in the Marines do construction and demolitions through explosives. And uh, I never constructed anything. I never built anything. I always had explosives. Um, I was generally attached to an infantry unit. Uh, and when you think about an infantry unit going and kicking doors down, we're, we're doing door charges and, and minefield breaches and things like that uh, at the front lines of combat. So um, when I would plug in my MOS to a skills translator, you know, historically uh, through any number, I'm not going to mention any names, but any number of these skills translators, it uh, the one that sticks out the most is that I should have been a bricklayer. Um, it told me to go be a bricklayer. Uh, not that that's not an honorable profession, but I don't know anything about laying bricks. I've never laid a brick. I've never built anything in my life. So, uh, so that was one of those interesting pieces for me. My own transition was tough, which probably lends to my success in, in what I do now. I've been there and done that. I was a non-traditional job seeker coming out of the armed forces without a very clear path of what happens next. It's when I see it, I, I don't necessarily think bricklayer. And the only thing that I can correlate to bricklayer is me on the basketball court. All I do is, is throw up bricks all day long. So that's the type of bricklaying that I do. Um, and I, I think it's it's so fascinating to hear that where you have this wealth of expertise in a number of different areas, and then you're matched to a job that you don't think that you would be the, the right fit for. Um, now, when we spoke, or when I spoke with with Andrew Whitman a little bit earlier, we, we talked about recruiters and the habit of looking for employee or candidates, excuse me, um, who have that traditional four year route. 
and how um, a lot of times mil people with military experience get overlooked. Uh, when it comes to your team and how they reach out, how do you, you train your team to, to think outside the box and, and really give those people with military experience a fair chance in interview and conversations? It is an ongoing conversation. Uh, it's something that we will never be able to tackle fully because uh, if you take the person who has not served in the military, it's virtually impossible to teach them everything about the different nuances in the military. And 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 even I, uh, having been in this, this is my whole career, uh, I still run into resumes sometimes where I have a little bit harder of a time uh, developing a... Uh, understanding what the person did in the military and how it translates to what we do here, how we can plug them into an operation here. Um, so I, I would venture to say that even for the civilian recruiter that's not well versed in this, it's going to be even harder. Um, you know, really where we start is is by telling success stories inside of the company, that taking the infantry leader from the Marine Corps and plugging them into an operations job. And then six months later, talking about how successful this person has been in their job, despite the fact that their military occupational specialty had nothing to do with necessarily what they're doing now on paper. We start with the success stories. And what that what that creates is a, a general curiosity among recruiters and hiring managers to want to take a deeper look. You know, there's this stat that says people look at resumes, recruiters and hiring managers look at resumes for eight seconds to 15 seconds, uh, and they make an assumption based on that. The idea is talking about different resources and skills and, and just giving them exposure to this population so that the next time one of these resumes rolls across their desk, they take a little bit longer than 15 seconds. Maybe they take a minute, maybe they even pick up the phone because what they have here is, hey, I see 20 years of military experience here. I don't know exactly how to plug that into my business, but let me call this person and ask them. Because what happens if you talk about a 20 year military career, think about the way that resumes are written now. It's one or two page document is the standard. Uh, you take a 20 year military career. If you were to write down all of the skills and experiences this person has had, it becomes a 40 page document and you're yeah. not going to give some a hiring manager a 40 page document. So we we have to keep the intellectual curiosity going. We have to do some translation, but there's so many jobs in the military that we just really have to engage our recruiters and hiring managers to understand the value of hiring this population and they'll go after it themselves. I think you raise an, an excellent point there of just having the conversations. Because when I think of, of the armed forces, I know that they're separate branches and I'm sure that they have their own nuances, their own terminology. Um, so when we talk about the kind of this idea of an evolved recruiter and where artificial intelligence and thing like things like that, can give time back in their day and allow them to become talent advisors. A lot of becoming a talent advisor is, is just having that conversation, right? If mm -hmm. somebody reaches out to you and you are unsure about their background or unsure about how it applies to this position, ask them about what they're looking for, what jumped out at them, where those, uh, Andrew mentioned, those, those problem-solving skills. So really applying that. And the only way, I'm a firm believer in, in learning by doing, right? I think... Right. It, you could probably have a number of trainings and things like that that will certainly help. But the only way that recruiters are really going to be able to apply this sort of, uh, you know, it really uh, approach is to have those conversations and learn things on their own through experience. Right. Um, so you mentioned a, a tremendous uh, amount of success stories that you've been sharing with the team. Um, I, and we also talked about the search bar a little bit earlier. Are some of those success stories something that you're sharing out in campaigns and, and really actively using to increase that pipeline of, of veterans and, and military professionals? We do. Uh, we do a lot of that through social and professional media. We share the success stories of the people that we've brought on through uh, different programs inside of the company, whether they are in fellowships or internships from you know the Department of Defense SkillBridge program or the Hiring Our Heroes fellowship programs. We love to share those stories because it does illustrate what happens when you take a person who is currently wearing the uniform and plug them into the business. And so, uh, and, and, and how that translation happens or rather how that parallel happens, uh, in the course of three to six months when they're leaving the armed forces, they take off the uniform, put a suit on, and now they are a top performer inside of the organization. So absolutely. We share those. Uh, we, d we do a lot of, uh, campaigning. We do a lot of the social media campaigns and, and, um, internal campaignings through Phenom, uh, uh, firing off. Largely what we do is, is through those tools, we're able to tell uh, skill sets of candidates and then match them up to campaigns uh, so that, you know, for example, I can wrap a fence around New York City. If I'm looking for a maintenance technician or an engineer or a property manager, I can wrap a, a fence around that city and I can build a campaign around 
those people and say, hey, this is the job for you based on your experience that I've identified. So we have a lot of different ways that we reach people in there. That's that's awesome. And I, I love that idea of also targeting it, right, as well. Um, even though um, we're, we're living in a, a more and more remote workforce world, um, that idea of targeting messaging to specific individuals in a specific area that you know have XYZ experience is only going to increase success rate. Um, now, the other thing that has been a huge topic for us on the show and really in recruitment overall is video, right? Um, there's a reason why we're having this conversation over video and not just exchanging emails and then publishing that. It, it engages people. So is video something that you're leveraging as well? And if not, is it something that you plan to do in the future to really tell that story? Yeah, I'll tell you that uh, obviously COVID put a wrench in a lot of things. So there's there's a, a certain way that we've had to do things differently and, and, and adapt, which is, uh, you know, one of the best skill sets or experiences that the military has to offer is is adaptation. When the, you know, the, the best laid plan goes out the window when the first shot is fired. So we said in the in the Marines um, and we've had to adapt, you know, on the fly as well. So, yes, we're we are. For 2021, we're looking at a, a larger video presence, uh, and that's from video campaigning on down to, to how we do interviews. But we've we've already you know, we stepped right into it when uh, when COVID came around and, and we were forced to have face to face interactions. As I mentioned before, we are um, we're doing well despite the, the, the unique challenges of the year. Um, but we were forced to have face-to-face -face conversations as we are now, uh, because you're right. It's, it's not engaging just to have a phone call. And, and especially if you have to make a hiring decision through a series of interviews without a video call, without being able to uh, see facial expressions and understand who you might be working with or working for makes it very difficult. So to answer your question, going into 2021, uh, we're going to continue to utilize these tools uh, for interviewing and maybe get a little bit better at it, but the, on a larger scale for campaigning and just you know reaching more people and putting faces with names and things like that, uh, we have to. It's it's part of the adaptation of business. We have to do it to to, to stay competitive. That's uh, it's awesome to hear that, that the future sounds exciting. It's holding new things um, for you. You're going to include video and, and really continue to adjust with the, the not so perfect times that we're dealing with right now. Um, the other thing that, that I wanted to say, when we first kicked this off, you said that Cushman isn't necessarily a household name. It's certainly a household name for me. Every time I walk down the streets of Philadelphia, I see fence with Cushman Wakefield on there right now. So it's it's getting out there. And I, I guess the, the next thing that, that I will ask is if anyone um, who's watching the show or catches the, the replay later wants to learn more about military hiring at Cushman or, or anything along those lines, is there a place that they can go um, and really find more information and, and potentially uh, set up an interview or apply? They can. I mean, first of all, they can Google Cushman and Wakefield and, and just go directly to our home site, or they can go to cushwakevets.com, which is a uh, platform that, that shares our unique experience around military hiring and, and military efforts. We do a lot more inside of our company uh, than just hiring military. We do a lot of philanthropic support to the military and veteran community and, and among, among other things. Uh, we do hiring very well, but uh, we we believe that it's, it's a holistic approach to um, uh, to not just to gain business for us and gain the top talent, but also to, to give back. Because a lot of the people that, that I work alongside of inside of the company are veterans themselves or huge advocates for the, the military and, and veteran community. So we believe that if we give back to that community, if we do it holistically, if we are genuine about our efforts, that uh, uh, we'll continue to benefit from that. Um, so CushWakeVets.com, of course, candidates, anybody uh, anybody who wants to benchmark or, or pick my brain on what strategies work. I've been doing this for a number of years. I can be found on LinkedIn. Uh, I don't think uh, as Andrew said, he, he know, there's no fences up around me. Um, I don't think there are very many Matt Dishers uh, on LinkedIn. It's not a very common name. So go in there and find me and connect with me. Uh, I, I try to respond in a timely manner to LinkedIn messages, but I connect with virtually everybody who wants to have a conversation. All right. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I appreciate your time, Matt. I'm going to look you up on LinkedIn and test you on how long you do respond. Uh, I might even put in the subject line, this is not a sales reach out because I feel like that's all I get on LinkedIn now. It is. Uh, <laughs> uh, but anyway, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Remember to check out um, CushWakeVets.com. CushWakeVets.com. Correct. Awesome. Awesome. Matt, I'll give you the rest of the time back of your day. Thank you again for your appreciate service. It. Thank you, and Kevin. Absolutely.
Now we will bring on Sean O'Donnell, our product uh, manager here, uh, to talk about the military search hiring code and what that actually looks like. We talked a lot about it during this show today, so why not give you a sneak peek on what it actually looks like? Sean, how are you, my man? Devin. Devin, I, I can't see you. Are you camouflaged? <laughs> I am. Oh, I am. Hopefully. Oh, there you are. There you are. Yes. Very good. Very good. <laughs> I, I, I found it. I, I felt it would be fitting to wear the little bit of camo that I have. This is an important topic. Yesterday, we celebrated Veterans Day. Um, and today, we're talking all around military hiring. And I know you have a little bit of experience around what we're doing here at Phenom when it comes to military hiring. So I figured who better than to bring you on? Oh, thanks for having me. Yeah. And, um, you know, thanks for putting me behind uh, Matt and Andrew. They were very uh, energetic. So um, hard, hard acts to follow, but I'll try my best. So, yeah, as a product manager here, uh, we're always trying to find out what's the most innovative and, and what can we do that other people are doing and do it better. And we, as uh, Andrew pointed out, there's some military skills translators out there that are fairly run of the mill and as Matt pointed out, don't work very well. So we figured we would put our powerful brains to the task and see what we could bring to it that was innovative. And that's where we rolled out our military search product. I believe it was about April of this year, we rolled it out. Awesome, awesome. Would we be able to, to take a, a sneak peek and see what it, see what it yeah, looks like here? Yeah, I don't absolutely. Know. And before I do, I, why don't I just explain to you some of the philosophies about it as well. Um, I have to share my screen. How do I do that? Oh, share screen. That one right there. Okay. Fantastic. Don't show these tips again. Uh, let's see here. All right. I think I got it. You're looking at some military and vets page right yep. there. Fantastic. We got it up. Great. So a little bit of the philosophy behind it. You know, when we saw military skills translators out there, what you'll notice they don't have is any AI behind it. They do just basic rudimentary skills. They take a position in the military, they get some skills out of it, and then they match those skills. And a lot of times what they ask people to do, especially recruiters, is write those skills into the jobs that they want military uh, applying for. So you can see it's very work heavy and it doesn't make anybody's life or job easier. Mm -hmm. So what we wanted to do was a few things that we want to understand the experience. So when you come to our, a site that has our military search, we're speaking your language, we're speaking your military codes. So you as a military person don't need to think about how it translates. And on the other side, as talent acquisition, we don't need you to think about how it translates either. All we need you to do is write your job description and then our AI machine is gonna bring the handshake together. So you give us the code, we'll um, look in our database, what are the skills and titles associated with that code. Then we'll look at other skills in our ontology and find things that maybe you wouldn't think about and offer those as suggestions as well. So some things may look like obvious suggestions and some things may look not so obvious, but what you can understand as a, as a job searcher is that our AI is working for you and is, is thinking beyond some of the things that you can think of. So why don't I, I use some codes and demonstrate that for you now, okay? That would be great, Sean. And I know, Phenom, we have 54 languages um, that we're live in. Would you consider this language number 55? Uh, at 55, 56, and 57, you know, there are a number of branches in the military. And there, we speak there, all there. Of them, so, yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Fantastic. All right. So uh, here I am uh, at Microsoft. Um, and uh, the first code I'll put in here is uh, 31 Papa 2. So security forces, right? And what you'll do is when you do when you find a job there, we'll get a, a list back. And um, you can see here, our facets allow you to separate. Are you more experienced or less experienced? So you might be looking for an entry level job uh, here in the security, or, or you might be looking for a more experienced job. And we're gonna give you those suggestions. So you can see here as more experienced, you have a national security officer, you have security analyst, security researcher, and the list goes on and on and on. And um, I think what you find is as you get further down the list, things start moving away from security and start into moving into other skills. And that's where we talk about the AI coming into um, 
into play here. So, um, you know, like this account technology strategist, you might not ever thought that that was for you, but you in browsing, you may say, hey, wait a sec, that does fit these skills that it's not just that I can do one certain skill, it's I can do skills related to that. And I think Andrew was talking about that and it, uh, it's very uh, poignant that he was. All right, I'll give you another one here. How about 35 Papa 4, uh, Papa 4. So there we have public affairs. And as we go into that, same sort of um, uh, ontology with it. So you can see we have a government affairs suggestion. We have a, a, a public sector marketing and communications lead. So obviously very in, uh, relevant stuff right there at the top. But then as you move on down, maybe you're looking to be an attorney. <laughs> you know, maybe you're grad, you uh, have some skills in that area as well. Strategic partnerships. There's something that's outside of the realm of public affairs uh, sort of specifically, but a lot of transferable skills in strategic partnerships. Um, and again, experience versus uh, entry level. Okay, how about I give you uh, one more here with Microsoft. And I did this one specifically, 2181, Ground Ordnance Weapons Chief. Okay, I don't know how many weapons Microsoft has uh, inside their uh, product catalog. I'm guessing maybe not many. And it was certainly nothing here related to weapons, but actually look what we see here in the experience level. I mean, you're a weapons chief, so what are you doing? You're strategic, you're influential, you're reporting up to uh, advanced uh, executives. Well, maybe you'd be a good chief of staff. We have two locations for that. We have another location for a chief of staff in Redmond. Maybe you just need to be a senior business manager. Maybe you have some software skills, so you'd want a senior level software um, skill uh, a type job. So that's, uh, as we go further down the list, we start seeing things like that. So uh, that was Microsoft. I'll just go to our good friends over here at Cushman. Um, and uh, I, you know, I just read they were 2020s, uh, I, I think it was gold level military hiring. So they're, this is helping them in their, uh, achieve their uh, benchmarks for military hiring for sure. And I'll just give you one here because I think Matt said it best here. Um, you know, a ship turned upside down is just like a, a building. So let's say I was a hull maintenance technician and I search on that. Well, look what we got here. Commercial plumber, maintenance tech, HVAC. Um, and we go down more HVAC, mobile engineer, building operating engineer, all these things. Okay. You're not working on a boat, but turn that boat upside down and you got a building. And these are all the things that are associated with that. So I think these examples show how we're not just flat out skills matching. We're not asking our, our talent acquisition specialists or our hiring managers to write this stuff into their job description. You write the job description as a job seeker, you give us the code and we will marry the two together and find you the right job. Sean, this is awesome as a whole. And the one thing that I love about it is, is that it's AI being applied in a real practical use case that's kind of been overlooked previously, right? But we, we asked our, our veterans um, that when they're looking to return to the workforce to really just try and keyword search. Um, and that's not speaking their language, right? That's not helping them find the right job, which is Phenom's purpose here. So it's awesome to see that. I don't know if Microsoft produces any weapons other than the Xbox, which I can't get my hands on right now. Um, but it, it is awesome to see that there are other opportunities that people can apply themselves that aren't necessarily blip layers, that aren't some of those positions that Matt and I talked about before. And they can take their skills that they've learned through protecting our country and protecting the citizens and really apply them once they return home and return to work. So this is awesome. Sean, I thank you so much for joining me. Any parting shots? Any last things that you'd like to say? No parting shots uh, other than the Xbox uh, thing. I, I heard you're a PS5 man anyway. It doesn't make a difference. <laughs> but, uh, um, yeah, no, we, we're really excited to put this product out. We're constantly improving it. As codes change, we change. We update them. Um, and we hope that, uh, you know, this is our way of saying thank you to the veterans. Maybe we can help you find the right job um, by not only thinking of the skills you, you, the hard skills you had, but the secondary and tertiary skills that you may not even know you have. Well, Sean, thank you so much. I'll let you get back to your busy day updating all of those codes. Thank you once again for tuning in to Talent Experience Live. We look forward to seeing you next week. We're going to be talking all around employer branding. So super, super excuse me, very important topic. Don't miss it. Uh, subscribe to our social channels and we'll see you then. Have a good one.